So as I finish up some of the projects that I've begun on this channel, I do think it's important that uh, this channel not only be dedicated to expounding on um, scholastic metaphysics and Catholic philosophy and theology, etc., but also through, you know, maybe a series of scattered, relatively short videos to go into a bit of depth as to why some of the more uh, rarefied and abstract uh, dimensions of scholastic metaphysics, you know, to show how those actually bear relevance, not only to our own intellectual life, but also to our moral, spiritual, and even political lives. You know, it's very easy and understandable to get the impression that uh, when we dive into something like, you know, the distinction between form and matter, for, for example, that the most we're doing is just enriching our intellectual life for thoroughly academic purposes. But I've always been rather insistent on this channel that that could not be further from the truth. Now, of course, it may not be necessary for the general public to understand metaphysical themes at this level, but I think it would be absurd to say that ideas have no consequences and that the influence that institutions have on society uh, are not shaped dramatically by the intellectual milieu of the time, even if the vast majority of people obviously don't think about these underlying causes of uh, the worldview that they're grown into sort of by default. So I think it's important to discuss therefore not only the content of these abstract principles but also show how they bleed into other perhaps more practical and close to home uh, facets of human life uh, now the first of these that i want to discuss here would be philosophical realism or uh, the general view which insists that universally predicable properties or universals or forms or essences um, you know the, the the basic identities of things uh, that they refer to realities that exist independently of the mind's consideration, wholly anterior to the mind's consideration, that is. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that whether we're talking about uh, Platonic realism or Thomistic realism or Scotistic realism, there's a wide uh, divergence about how those in the realist camp discern the proper way in which universals or essences or forms are to truly be considered extramental. So, this is by no means an attempt to adjudicate um, which articulation is objectively speaking superior. And nor is the thesis of this video to suggest that you know the fall of the West or something is due exclusively to nominalism or something, um, which is obviously an overly simplistic and ahistorical and even philosophically illiterate take on the historical development of Western thought. These videos are not even really meant to uh, diagnose historically developed evils. This is just to articulate why some of the more abstract material that I cover on this channel, why some of it does indeed bear direct and significant relevance to our spiritual, moral, and political capacities as human beings. So let's just begin. Now, as far as the spiritual significance of philosophical realism is concerned, I think that a lot can be said. One of the most important spiritual or theological implications of philosophical realism, it seems to me, is its central importance uh, to how we are related to God himself. If philosophical realism is true, and particulars really do share in some uh, universal formality or higher principle of an irreducible participated unity that is human nature, then that immediately begs the question of where these irreducible unities truly originate from. And the Christian answer, according to interpretations varying from a more Neoplatonic bent to a more moderated uh, peripatetic Aristotelian bent, is that these universals or shared unities ultimately derive from the divine mind itself, that they are finite, fragmented images of God's own eternally begotten, consubstantial self-image of himself, within himself. And what this means for us on a spiritual level is that human beings are not just you know, atomized individuals that happen to share broad family resemblances, but they share in an irreducibly holy unity that has its origin in God's own self-manifestation. It means that something as intimately present to us as our own nature is in reality immediately uh, a present theophany of the divine himself. It also means that we can expect God to act in accordance to the ideas that he has in his own mind, which are really one with his own essence, according to, according to divine simplicity. So I would say that it safeguards against uh, 
a hyper fideistic um, approach to God that precisely because he creates the world through these universals that are discernible by the mind, we can therefore uh, have a rational expectation that God will act in the world according to these universals or forms that are present in reality and discernible to our minds. So I think it it uh, fosters a, a, a sense of uh, relatability to God on our end. Now, when you get into the moral implications, I think the ramifications of philosophical realism become a bit more direct and straightforward. I mean, I would go so far as to uh, regard it as the primary guardian of defense in the philosophical order of you know, traditional moral norms, simply speaking, generally. And, and that is because the binding force for traditional morality, particularly in its universal applicability, is necessarily grounded, I think, in a common human nature, which can serve as the basis upon which certain acts are deemed good or evil. It doesn't depend necessarily on physical harm, consent, or even some non-aggression principle or Kantian categorical imperative. It is rather based on which actions conduce toward the perfective good demanded by human nature and which actions run counter to that perfective good. And what is required for this is that, uh, in order for it to be tenable, that is, is that there be an extra mentally existent human nature whose teleological inclinations and perfective capacities are imbued within the particularly existing human being. Now, were this not the case, you would, as a logical consequence, run into two absurd extremes. On the one hand, if the evaluation of human acts are divorced or cut off from the teleological ends for which those actions are performed, which originate from the form or the universal of human nature, then we would have to reduce ethics to a mere conceptual analysis of actions disconnected from the rational ends for which those actions are performed. Now, on the other hand, if the moral evaluation of human acts um, severs rational ends from the object of the act itself, then this would inevitably result in a brute uh, consequentialism that would remove the possibility of intrinsically evil acts of any kind from the equation. So it's my contention that philosophical realism is in a unique position to remedy these two extremes and to bring about a moral theory that can simultaneously be grounded in reason while also safeguarding the legitimacy of our basic moral intuitions, which usually tend to um, serve as a bedrock of traditional morality in particular. The reason for this is that if we recognize that human actions in their intelligible structures already contain within them an imminently present uh, teleological blueprint flowing from the universal form of human nature instantiated in the human moral agent, then the moral act can be evaluated within the framework of ends that are already given. Now what this ensures is that while acts must be evaluated in terms of the ends for which they are performed, such ends must be evaluated and judged in reference to the ends already imbued in the agent by virtue of that moral agent's very nature. Because the moral agent has a nature given to him by God, then that agent must respect the teleological limitations imposed upon the agent by that nature in order to truly live an authentic moral life. As Stephen Long puts it, quote, if we omit relation to reason or end, from the consideration of the moral object as such, then we lose the very ratio or reason under which that act enters into the uh, action of the agent, unquote. And then he goes on to say, quote, on the other hand, if we exclude from the object of the moral act, the matter constituted by the very act itself and its integral nature, then we run into problems of an entirely different kind, unquote. And that coheres with what I outlined earlier. My solution, therefore, is that because, quote, everything moves to its end by reason of its form, objects exhibit a per se or a natural order toward certain ends, irrespective of the further purpose or purposes agents may thereby pursue. Thus, some objects may be known by this very uh, teleological datum as objectively contrary to a good life, and so not choice-worthy because they are defined in relation to morally deficient ends, no matter what further end one may thereby seek, unquote. You know, take the whole uh, realm of sexual ethics, for example. 
if the male and the female expressions of human nature were not received from a source wholly anterior or prior to the mind's consideration, but instead are just, you know, mental uh, constructions used to describe raw biology, as it were, then there can't really be a moral obligation to preserve and respect those expressions of human nature. They would just be tantamount to biological matter that could be manipulated for some rational end, and that rational end could be completely detached from the givenness of human nature. Without philosophical realism, therefore, um, sexual differences have no built-in metaphysical basis for imposing moral prescriptions on the human conscience, more or less outside the dimensions of, you know, consent or harm or, or, or some other um, extrinsic purpose. So even if you could concoct some sort of uh, sociological rationale for respecting traditional sexual mores, so long as those negative externalities could be averted by some other preventative mechanisms, well, there'd really be no argument to unequivocally condemn, say, uh, unnatural sexual acts or gender ideology or anything like that. Only when the uh, complementary sexual expressions of human nature in male and female are imbued in the very nature of humanity itself, can there truly be a basis upon which to ground an absolute moral imperative to respect uh, that particular dimension of human nature? Now, with all that said, I don't think it should be too difficult to foresee major political implications that might follow upon accepting or uh, rejecting philosophical realism. If there really does exist a human nature imbued in extra mental reality, and if this human nature comes with it a pre-existing moral law by virtue of the intrinsic link between a thing's form and its imminent uh, perfective ends, then this truth must impose itself not only on human beings living individually, but also on the state itself. Moreover, I think the very legitimacy of the state as an intrinsic good depends precisely upon its origin in human nature, that is, reflective of extra mental reality wholly anterior to the mind's consideration only when the legitimacy of the state has its origin in this extra mental reality of human nature can once again two extremes be avoided on the other hand we would avoid a scenario in which the state emerges only as a necessary evil in order to you know curtail uh, excesses of human behavior and of course uh, this is usually just interpreted through the lens of harm or violation of consent on the other hand, the extra mental universality of human nature and therefore the natural moral law embedded within it also puts limits on the state. The state is limited precisely in the measure that it cannot violate this natural moral law. That means it must respect those rights which flow from human nature as such, as well as inculcate the duties and virtues intrinsic to human nature within the populace. So we have a basis here for the intrinsic legitimacy of stately authority insofar as human nature inclines toward forming the society, and we also have a basis for the state's own naturally imposed limitations and restrictions. So, sort of in closing here, while I do concede that other metaphysical theories may be able to serve as the basis for some of this, some of this stuff, I do think that what I've articulated shows the importance of uh, philosophical realism beyond merely the scope of abstract metaphysics. Ideas do matter, and well, as I said, it is never easy to draw out uh, of this fact historical pedigrees. It is, I think, rather straightforward to draw from this discernible implications which follow from these ideas in a timeless uh, or vertical manner. And that's kind of what I aim to do in this series. So the next aspect of Thomistic metaphysics that I plan to tackle would be uh, the distinction between act and potency. So do stick around for that. Uh, it should hopefully be out in like two weeks or so. So if uh, you like this video, give it a like, comment, uh, subscribe. You can sign up for my Patreon if you want. Uh, now for $5, you'd get uh, monthly book recommendations, uh, Q&A priority, and access to audio files to videos. And for five more, you'd also get all of that plus a guaranteed uh, video request, so long as it pertains to, you know, philosophy or theology. So, like I said, I hope that was helpful. Uh, do stick around for the next one. God bless.